Yeah. Hey, man. God bless you, man. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. You too. Hey, man. Uh, Job 37, if you would. Uh, book of Job. Uh, let me make sure I'm on here. I believe I got it on. I flipped the button over to. Yep, all right. Job 37. Boy, it sure is good to be here. Yeah, and I was sharing with somebody a while ago, it's not like this everywhere. I don't, don't, don't think it's like this everywhere you go. I'm in a different church just about every week, and uh, I'm telling you, it's not like, I like it, man. It don't make me nervous a bit when people get to shouting and praising the Lord and crying and wiping their eyes. That's the way it should be. And you would think, you would think, that all of us being cut from the same cloth, that it's like this everywhere you go. Now, I'm telling you, he's worth our praise. Amen. Amen. Now, to some of you, and to some of y'all who are allergic to worship and allergic to worshiping and allergic to crying and singing and raising, I don't know what you're going to do doing in heaven while the rest of us, right. amen. I guess you're just going to have to find yourself a place in a corner somewhere and just take some lessons. Amen. I was sharing with somebody a while ago. I was in a church just a couple of months ago. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. There must have been 700 people in there, and I'd have paid somebody to cough. <laughs> Unto the Lord. I'd have, pay, I'd have paid somebody, I'd have paid a, a bee to come in there, and at least somebody swat at the bee or something. <laughs> the whole entire church service sat there with a coldness and a deadness and a spirit of dryness on their face and never even changed expression. But that same crowd, probably the night before, when their ball team was winning, amen, when their ball team scored a touchdown or when Bobby hit a double, amen, they was climbing the fence and praising him, but they wouldn't praise the God who saved them, who redeemed them, who gave them a new life in Christ for nothing in the world, amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. That's free. I will not charge you for any of that. Amen. Job 37. Let's look at it. I want to read uh, the first 10 verses. I've never preached this message. I've wanted to, but I've never have. I'm a little nervous about that. Uh, I worked on it a little bit yesterday, and I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, if this is the direction you'd have us to go, I pray you'd give me peace about that, and he did. And so I want to try to help you with it. It'll probably be short, probably the shortest message ever preached, but I just want to try to help you a little bit out of it, draw some truths out of it, and uh, maybe help you down the road a little bit. I'll be honest with you, amen. I, if you do like wintertime, thank God for you, praise God for you. I hate wintertime. Can I get a witness in the church house? I hate, I just want to go on record right now and say I hate Winter time, amen. I don't like cold weather. I don't like the snow. I got three and a half inches of my, at my house last week. I don't like snow. I don't like frost. I don't like the wind. Praise God, give me springtime. Give me summertime. Give me bass fishing. Give me gardening. Amen. Give me smelling the flowers. Did I tell you I don't like winter time? I just want to make that clear where I stand before I leave here today. But just as much as there is a summer, as there's a spring, there's a fall, there's going to be a winter time. And God is doing something in the winter time. There's something going on in the earth as I speak. You go outside, there's nothing growing, there's nothing living, but I can assure you that the God of heaven is doing something in the earth. Here in just a few months, You'll start, mm, you'll start seeing some things spring forth and life will come back. And if it had not been a winter time, there would never be a springtime. I want you to understand that. Job 37, let's look at it. At this, verse 1, at this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Now what in the world could make a man's heart tremble? What in the world could make a man's heart be moved out of his place? And I believe Brother Job is just kind of saying this. When I look at the majesty and when I look at the power and I look at the essence and I, I look at the presence of God and what God does and just by his simple voice spoke things into existence, didn't have to move his hand, but just simply opened his mouth and he hung the stars in the sky Amen. He put the snow on the earth. He put the rain on the earth just simply by his voice. 
And when Job sees that, Job realizes how small mm, he is and just how big God is. Amen. And I think Job is saying this, if there's anybody I don't want to get sideways with, if there's anybody I don't want to get out of touch with, if there's anybody I don't want to get out of tune with, if there's anybody I don't want to get far away from, it is the God of heaven. I want to walk with him. I want to fellowship with him. I want to feel his power. I want to feel his presence. And if there's, listen to me now, I'm going to be real transparent with you in this message today. If there's anything that I've learned in the last four years is this I need God. I, need, I tell you this, I've learned this. He don't need me. Boy, but I sure need him. He can go on without me, but I can't go on without him. The further I go in this journey, the more I'm learning that. I didn't understand that in my younger days. I thought I could do a lot of things on my own. I'm going to tell you what, I, I, I'll steal a phrase from the old song. I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I've tried it. And brother, it don't work. I don't want to get out of step with him. I don't get out of tune with verse 2. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directed it under the whole heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. After the voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of excellency. He will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We're going to come back to that. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, be thou on the earth. Likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. Amen. We've seen some great rain around my house. <laughs> we had 11 and a half inches of rain about two Thursdays ago. Then three days later we had three and a half inches of snow on top of that. Lord, the water don't have nowhere to go. But God can bring the great rain. Amen. He sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. In verse 6, we have the snow. In verse 9, we have the cold, and we have the frost. In verse 10, well, in verse 9, we have the cold, and in verse 10, we have the frost, and we have the ice. The waters are straightened. I believe that's when the waters freeze up. All of these, these three things are wintertime events, and here you and I are in the middle of wintertime. And once again, I don't like wintertime, but I know wintertime is a necessary thing. And I want to preach to you just a little bit on this thought, how to survive your wintertime. How to survive your wintertime. There is a phenomenon sweeping the United States of America. And there's a show that I love watching. It comes on Thursday nights called Homestead Rescue. Does anybody want, do y'all get cable down here? Amen. Y'all got to pump in sunshine. <laughs> Homestead rescue. And what people are doing is taking what they've worked for and labored for for years, taking their 401ks, taking their savings account, and they're selling everything they've got with the idea of moving off grid. That sounds good. <laughs> to get, amen. To get away from the hustle to get away from the bustle, to get away from the confusion that the city brings. You go to Greenville, it'll make you want to move off grid. <laughs> Amen. You drive around in Greenville, it'll make you want to find somewhere else to go. And so these people sell everything they've got and they buy them a piece of property in the wilderness or on a mountain range or down by a river somewhere. And they say, we're going to spend the rest of our days in peace. <laughs> And tranquility away from it all. And it, don't, and it don't take them long to find out they were not prepared for what nature and the earth will bring them during times of season. Oh, they seem to do all right in the springtime. 
Amen. When they got things growing, when they've got crops and they've got, they've got things for the cattle to feed on and they seem to do okay in the summertime and they seem to do okay in the fall time, but when winter time comes... Amen. When winter time comes and the winds begin to blow and the cold begins to set in, they begin to struggle and find it hard to survive the winter time. Amen. And they got to pick up the phone and they got to call Marty Rainey, <laughs> who's been doing this for 40 years. And Marty Rainey and his son and his daughter come and visit that homestead for one week. And, that, and they begin to teach them how to survive in that winter time. And they look and they assess the property and they tell them, you will never survive the winter time in the condition that you're in. I found that to be a spiritual application. Most of us in this building this morning, oh, we'll sing and we'll shout and we'll raise our hands and we'll praise the God of heaven and we should, but you and I are not prepared for what's coming in our life. Well, we need to make some preparations for winter time. Number one, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the surety of trouble. I want you to look at verse 16. I want you to look at verse 16. Dost thou know the balancings of the clouds. <laughs> Amen. Does that know the balancings of the clouds? You know what he's saying? There's going to be a spring. There's going to be a summer. There's going to be a fall. But there's coming a winter. Amen. There is a balance to this thing. And you as a believer, you're going to go through a winter time. You as a church, you're going to go through a winter time. Paul said it best. He said we are troubled on Every side. Job said, man born of woman is few days and full of trouble. Jesus told his disciples, let not your heart, let not your heart be troubled. Job 37 started out like this. At this also my heart trembleth. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. What does that mean? You can have trouble out here, and you're going to have trouble out here, and we need to learn how to walk in faith in the trouble. We need to learn how to walk without fear in the trouble. We need to learn how to trust God in the trouble. But I'm telling you, once trouble grips your heart, and once trouble grips your soul, you're liable to become a castaway and a casualty to the trouble. Guard your heart. That's what Solomon said. Why should I guard my heart? Because out of it flow the issues of life. The heart is the epicenter. Amen. The heart is the control center. It gets in your heart. It's going to move to your head. And soon you're going to be living out what's in the heart. Amen. At the heart of the matter, it is a matter of the heart. Amen. Boy, if we got locks on our cell phones. We got locks on our computers. We got locks on our cars. We got locks on our houses. Praise God. Spiritually, we ought to put a lock on our heart. Put a lock on our heart and be careful what we let grip our heart. Somebody help me now. The surety, the surety of trouble. Number two, the secret of trouble. I want you to look at verse five. I study numerology in the Bible. I, I'm fascinated by numerology. And a lot of times, if you'll study your Bible, the verses line up with the meaning of the numerology. <laughs> Verse 5. Five is the number of grace. <laughs> Amen. Grace, listen to me, grace won't help you understand the problem, but grace will sure help you through the problem. <laughs> Amen. 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 The surety of trouble, number one, but the secret of trouble, number two. Watch this. Let's read verse 5. God thunders marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he. Amen. Everybody says amen to that. Boy, we, we can go outside and we can look at the mountain ranges and we can look at the hillsides and we can look at the countryside. We can look at the ocean and we can surely say in our heart and in our mind, boy, God does great things. But when it comes to death, when it comes to suffering, when it comes to hardship, when it comes to pain, we say, 
I can't comprehend that. Do you see the parallel there in verse 5? God doeth great things. We can't comprehend. God doeth great things in nature. But I can't comprehend why he allowed that to happen in my life. Hello, friend. I'm trying to help you. You know what? You know what? You know what they're saying here? You know what the dialogue is? We always need to look at what God does great instead of what we don't know. Amen. Oh, yeah, during troubled times, we tend to look at what we don't know. And I'm gonna tell you what'll drive you crazy is what you don't know. <laughs> It'll drive you nuts. You know why tomorrow's driving you nuts right now? Because you don't have a clue what tomorrow holds. So why are we worried about what tomorrow holds instead of looking at who holds tomorrow? Amen. 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 The three Hebrew children, before they were thrown in the fiery furnace, they didn't stand there and look at the ashes from the previous burn. Amen. Hello, friend. They didn't look at the temperature gauge on the furnace. You know what they said? They stepped up to the line with their death certificate stamp, and they said, we know, we know our God is able to deliver us. I know we're facing sure death. I know we're facing a winter time. I know we're facing a hardship. But I know my God's able to deliver me. My God's not powerless. My God is infinite in mercy and power. And he's able to deliver me. Amen. Job, when he stood before them ten caskets, with disease eating his flesh, with his uh, wallet empty, because of his finances were gone. Children were gone. Everything he worked for was gone. He didn't scratch his head and say, well, I guess tomorrow I need to go down and file for bankruptcy. Amen. He didn't call the local bank and say, hey, I need to borrow some money. He didn't find the local church somewhere and say, can you take up a love offering for me? He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer liveth. Every day you and I can wake up and put our feet on the floor and say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a child of the King. I know God answers prayer. And I know His promises are true. Why are we looking at what we don't know? Let's start looking at what we do know. Down there's a formula. There's a formula here for surviving the wintertime. And I want to look at it and give it to you real quickly, real quickly. Number one, don't waste it. Don't waste your winter time. I'll be honest with you, I've wasted a lot of time this winter. Would you agree? I mean, things need to be done around the house. And I'll just be honest with you, it's a chore for me to want to go outside. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it when it's 25 degrees outside and I've got to go knock the frost. I just don't like it. I've wasted a lot of my winter time. I've put aside chores Help me now. That need to be done, and we should not waste our winter time. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. He calls it it to come, <laughs> whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Amen. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you. My wife died this month four years ago, and I ain't got over that. You say you ain't real spiritual. You walk a mile in my shoes, you come back and report to me how spiritual you are. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm still needing help from that. Amen. I was standing there by her casket. We stood there, I guess, two, two and a half hours as the people filed through. There were more than 25 preachers came through. And about seven or eight of them, I didn't understand it, gray-headed, been down the road a few miles, traveled a few miles, been in this thing a while. They would shake my hand, and every one of them said the same thing. They'd come up and whispered in my ear and say, Brother Darren, you need to go home today and say, What God? What God? What would you have me to do next? I'll be honest with you. You know what I was called up in? Why God? Why God? Why now God? Why her God? Why me God? Why in the world at 44 years old? Are you going to take my wife that I love? Why are you going to take her now that the church is doing good? Why are you going to take a, a mother from their children? Why God? And I wasted a lot of my winter time. And I'll stand before you today and say, I get, still get caught up in why. And every time, 
And every time I get caught up in the why, I find myself discouraged. I find myself defeated. I find myself in darkness. I find myself where I don't want to go on. Instead of saying, what God? You know what, what, you know what why says? You know what why says? I'm trying to figure it out. Oh, look at verse 5. Great things doeth he. We can't comprehend. Right. Joe Parsons, a dear, dear man of God, been in ministry for 50 years. He handed me this, and I've still got it. He slipped this in my hand when my wife died. And it says this. Don't try to figure it out. It's already been figured out. Amen. 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 I didn't open it that day. I forgot about it. But about three months later, I opened my Bible. And that little note fell out of my Bible at a, amen, at a time when I needed it. Don't waste it. Number one, consider. Look at verse 14. Hearken unto this. Hearken unto this. You know what that means? Listen well. Listen well. Turn your attention to it. Turn your ears to it. Give it your full focus. Watch this. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and say it with me. Consider. You know what that word consider means? Examine closely. You know what that word consider means? Dig your way to the truth. <laughs> you know what that word consider means? Don't make a decision until you've looked at the beginning of it, the middle of it, and the end of it. Too many of us have a knee-jerk reaction. You know what our problem is? We don't have the patience enough to consider. What are we to consider? Consider Him who was despised and rejected. Consider Him who endured the cross. Amen. Consider Him who took your place. Consider Him who bore your sin. Consider Him who shed His blood. And aren't you glad... He didn't allow the distractions. Aren't you glad he didn't allow the crowd? Aren't you glad he didn't, uh, he didn't despise those things? But he went all the way to Calvary for you and I. Consid I'm about to lose something here. I feel like my pants is falling down, but it's actually this microphone. <laughs> Amen. Consider him. Consider him. Consider Jesus and what he did for you. Oh, it pales into comparison, tempted and tried, just as you and I are, yet without sin. Consider Him. Consider this. Consider this. He can take a life that's upside down. He can take a situation that's backwards. He can take a situation that's dark. He can take a situation that seems helpless and seems hopeless, and He can bring help and light out of it. Only God can do that. God is the only person who can take death and turn into life. <sighs> He's the only person that can take what you thought was going to kill you and make you stronger out of it. <laughs> Amen. I think that's what the Apostle Paul said, was saying, he said, in my weakness, he has perfect strength. Oh, when I'm weakest, he's the strongest. When I'm, I'm, when I'm the furthest down, boy, I'm telling you what, he's lifting me up. Amen. Only God can do that. Well, number two, not only to consider, don't waste it, consider it. Number two, for correction, look at verse 13. He causes it to come, whether for correction. Well, we don't like correction, do we? Man, we don't like correction. I used to turn in that test paper, and man, that thing would come back and look like a red ink pen exploded on it. <laughs> Amen. Boy, there was a lot of correcting going on. <laughs> I mean, boy, they was X's and they was checks and they was circles. They was sad face. I never did get a smiley face, amen. I never did get one. Please God, if you did, but I did not get one. There was a lot of correcting going on on there. You know what a test reveals? You know what winter time reveals? Where we are weak. It reveals that. It shows us that. And you know what you and I are to do? We're to build that. We're to strengthen that. We are to go in and reinforce those areas that the winter time exposes. Jesus told Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan had desired to have you. He walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You watch, you watch the animal planet sometime. And I'll tell you that line, he'll lay in wait. You know, he's looking for the weak one. He's looking for the slow one. He's looking for the one that's got a little bit of a limp and a gimp. That's the easy prey. I'm preaching to people, some of you are easy prey for the devil. 
I'm talking about me too. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you this. Don't answer it. What area are you weak in? Let me ask you this. Do you think the enemy knows it? He knows more about us than we care to admit. I, I can't understand, Brother Darren, why I keep going through the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Probably because you failed in it the first time. <laughs> and the enemy knows you're vulnerable in that area, so he keeps attacking you in that area. And if you're not careful, he will take your knees out from under you, and you will be useless in the service of the Lord. Amen. Amen. My wife's death exposed me. It did. It exposed me. Brother Darren, pastor of Trenton Baptist Church, easily South Carolina. It exposed me. I had more holes in me spiritually than I had fingers to plug them up with. That's why we have such a trouble. That's why we have such a problem with trouble because it exposes our weaknesses. And you and I as Christians better be busy about plugging those holes. Number two, don't waste it. Number one, don't waste it. Number two, look at verse 14. Hearken unto this, O Job. Boy, you were to mark these next two words. Stand still. <laughs> Amen. Boy, in a busy world, people running to and fro. Stand still. You know what he's saying? You know what he's saying to Job? Quit trying to help God out. <laughs> Newsflash, God don't need your help. <laughs> Amen. Trouble comes. Boy, we want to get the Mr. Fixing gloves. We want to get the toolbox out and say, I know how to fix this. And God said, just stand still. Stand still. Be still. You ever got, you got kids? Oh, yeah. Amen. Something break around the house. You got that three-year-old. You get your toolbox out. He wants to get in there and he wants to get in there with your tools. He wants to get, he's, amen. He's all up in your way. You can't, you're saying, honey, come get this young man. Ain't that what God's saying to us? Can't you just go in a corner somewhere and stand still and watch the Master work? Let the Master do His work. You hire somebody to come to your house to fix your problem, you don't need to get out there on the ladder with them. Ain't room up for one. Hello, friend. Somebody going to get hurt. Am I preaching all right? Stand still. You know what he's saying? Number one, don't waste it. Number two, don't wander around. Why is it? Somebody explain this to me, maybe when at the end of the service. Why is it that on a day it's 85 degrees and sunshine outside, they ain't a car comes by my house, but you let the first snowflake fall. You let a little ice get on the road. Amen. And they'll be come flying up and down the road. They want to wander around in foul weather. I don't understand it. I had a lady... Come across my road, knock my fence down, landed in my front yard. People can't even drive when it's clear weather, much less when it's snowing outside. I woke up, big old Crown Vic, sitting in my front yard, slinging mud all over my house. That just happened the other week. After I done got hit head on. Ain't we having fun in Pickens County? What are you doing? I asked her, I'm not on that. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to work. <laughs> You're going to work? Your car is stuck in my front yard. Well, I thought I could make it on these slick roads. Why do we wander around? Stand still. Stand still and observe the work of God. Peter is a prime example. Jesus just commanded his disciples, he's going to get on board ship, you're going to the other side. Right in the middle of the storm. What's Peter decide to do? I'm getting out of the boat. <laughs> I've I got, I got to get out. Now you believe what you want to believe. I believe he thought his chances in the, were better in the water than they were on that raggedy boat. But listen to me, Jesus already made him a promise before they ever got out, you're going to the other side. And as soon as they started their journey, the first thing they encountered was a winter time. And Peter had... 
Peter had forgot the promise of God, so he decides he's going to step out on the water. And he said, Lord, if it be thou you, let me come to you. He was willing to get out of the boat and not even know if it was God or not. Right. You read this passage. Now, we make a hero out of him in there. We make a hero out of him. But you can preach that as a zero. You can go from a hero to a zero in just a few minutes when you wander away from God. And what happened to him? He begins to sink. But at least he had sense enough to say, Lord, save me. In one of the worst ice storms Green was ever seen, 2003, my mother, she's dead now. She died about a year and a half right before my wife did. My mother's dead now. We had one of the worst ice storms in Greenville. They were coming on and saying, please do not get out on the roads. Power lines down. Trees were down everywhere. Please, please, please stay home. Do not travel. It is treacherous. Mama got a little itch. I seen it. Mama got a little itch at the house. She said, I think I'm just going to get in the van, and I think I'm just going to ride around the block. I said, Mama, you need to stay in still. Yeah. Amen. Let God do his thing. I don't understand why people want to get out and wander around in foul weather. She said, just go, I'm just going to go down the road. Three and a half hours later, I'm walking the floors. I told Daddy, I said, she's dead, and both my kids are dead. I just know it. Three and a half hours later, I finally get a phone call. From my son. He said, Daddy, come, please come get us. We're stranded on top of Paris Mountain. I said, Paris Mountain, Paris Mountain, 30 minutes from my house. She said she was going one street over. Why do we get adventurous? Stand still and observe God. Last of all, last of all. Determined to wait. Look at verse 8. Don't waste it. Don't wonder. Why don't you look? Don't determine to wait. Determine to wait. Look at verse 8. Then the beasts go into dens. They got better sense than humans got. Hey Amen. They, they got better sense. They got dogs and birds and bears and cats and got better sense than humans got. Yeah. Human wants to come, if human wants to go out of shelter and into the storm, and then the, the beast wants to get out of the storm into the shelter. Now you explain that to me. Yeah. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Yeah. You know what they're doing? They're waiting out the storm. Yeah. The den is a place of restoration. The, the, amen. The den is a place of peace. The den is a place of comfort. And they go in there. And they wait. They stay in their place until the storm passes by. You know what I see that den as? Top of the church. <laughs> amen. Amen. You better abandon this idea. Well, I'll come back to church when the storm's over. I'll come back to church when it gets a little better. Right now it's a little rough around the house. And the best place you can be when it's rough around the house is in God's house. Where there's peace. Where there's comfort. Where there's restoration. Where there's refueling. Where there's re-energizing. God always makes provisions. They tell me that in these dens, there's always provisions. But the animals don't always eat. They, <laughs> well, we could preach right there for a while, can't we, brother? <laughs> They'll go in there, and there's food there. But they don't always partake of it. They should. They should partake of it. Man of God doesn't spend all week studying, prepared the table, and you come here and push back the table. That's right. That's right. If you invited me to your house and you laid a dead cat on the table and you say, this is what I've prepared for you all week, I'd say a big old prayer, amen, probably the longest one we've ever prayed. I'd take a deep breath and I'd do my best to eat that old furry cat. <laughs> amen. I would. I'd do my best and I'd leave there saying, thank God I'm still alive. Amen. But we think nothing at snubbing the message that was meant for us at the house of God. The man of God spent all week preparing. Boy, there's some provisions. God has always provided for His children in a winter time. Even the children, even the children of Israel, when they wandered in the wilderness, God provided for them. Elijah got down to the brook chariot. God provided for him. 
Aren't you glad for provisions at the house of God? Aren't you glad that a man of God will mount this pulpit three, four times a week and preach the Word of God to you and provide to you spiritual help that you need? Number one, there's vitality. There's strength at the house of God. David said this, Psalm 42, David said this, I went with them, I went with the multitude to the house of God. I went with them in my low time. I went with them in my hard time. I went with them with sorrow in my heart. But when I left there, oh yes, that's in verse 4. But he left there in verse 5. And he had a song. And he had some hope. And he had some joy. And he had some peace. And he had some comfort. David found vitality and strength at the house of God. As the deer panted after the water brook, so my soul panted. After thee, O oh God, as the deer is trying to pursue, is trying to get away from the pressure of the enemy, he just says, if I can get to a water brook, if I can get to a water source, I know I can make it. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank God for the house of God. Amen. Well, number two, there's only on vitality. There's a voice of God. <laughs> Six times in these 24 verses, you'll find the voice of God. The voice of God. Hearken unto this, O Job, His mighty voice. Aren't you glad for the voice of God? Aren't you glad we can leave here right now and say, boy, we've heard from God? Not because I'm preaching, but in the song service, we was hearing the voice of God. In the Sunday school hour, we was hearing the voice of God. During prayer time, we was hearing the voice of God. We don't need a pill. We don't need a program. The only cure for your winter time is the voice of God. And you can't get his voice at the house. Not when it comes worship time. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more. And so much the more. We need less church. No, we're in the and so much more days. We need more and more church. We need all the church we can get. We need the voice of God. Six times. The number of six is man. Man's greatest need is the voice of God. The voice of God changes things. The voice of God will turn midnight into daylight. Amen. The the, the voice of God will turn trouble into peace and calm. Number three, I'm done. We got provisions. We got vitality. We got His voice. We got victory. (laughs) We got victory. (laughs) Oh, don't close. I I, got to show you this. I got to show you this. Look, 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 Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. Hearken unto this, old Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Listen to me. Job's finding strength. He's finding vitality. He's finding the voice of God. And now Job's finding victory. Watch this now. Watch the progression. Verse 15. Dost thou, not, dost thou know when God disposed them and caused them the light of His cloud to shine? <laughs> oh... Look at verse 17. How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. (laughs) You know what they're saying? Job, if you'll just stand back and look at God and worship God, he may bring victory into your life. (laughs) You know what it calls you to miss the victory God has for you in the house of God? Pride. Amen. Pride. Church has become a good place for troubled people to come in and act like they got it all together. Come on, come on, come on. Be, hey, I've seen mom and daddy pull up in the parking lot, be fighting like cats and dogs, and they tell the kids in the back seat, don't y'all breathe a word to the preacher when you go in, that we've been fighting since Friday. The police have been to the house twice, and they come in. Right. Right. <laughs> Find their way to the choir. You know what that is? Pride. And amen. Pride will cause you to miss the help that you need. And if we had quit coming to the house of God, acting like we got it all together, God might visit you, come down, sit beside you, lift you up, put you by a well, and put it all back together again. I can show you in the Bible, when they began to praise God, God came on the scene and he stepped out on the bow and he said, Peace. Peace. Peace, be still. That's victory. That's victory. We need, we ain't seeing many victories. I preach to people every week 
who have determined in their heart they have lost the battle. And there's victory right here in Jesus. There's victory right here in the Word of God. There's help right here in the house of God. Let's stand together. Preacher, you come. I'm done. Thank you for your attendance today.